Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the participants of today's panel, Media Bias, Faith in Media. Your host and chief correspondent for the Christian Broadcasting Network, David Brody. Journalist and founder of Just the News, John Solomon. Attorney, author, and political commentator, Jenna Ellis. President and CEO of Voter Protection Alliance, Hogan Gidley. Well, we're really excited to be here, all of us, for sure. This is a uh, panel on media bias, so hopefully they provided Alka-Seltzer to every single one of you uh, out there. Uh, I've taken quite a few. Uh, I think we all have taken quite a few. You know, I, I say quite often, uh, I, I do a show called The Water Cooler uh, on Just the News and Real America's Voice, and I say true journalism, true journalism, I believe is dead right now in America. Uh, and, and we've got real issues. And so I want to start, John, with you, a true journalist, by the way, uh, John Solomon. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the landscape here with uh, the media bias we're seeing and what folks in this room really can, can do to navigate the truth in, in a very uh, untruthful environment. Well, I, I can sum it up with a little experience I had at a, a store the other day. A man came up to me, recognized me, and said, hey, I want to tell you about something. I think I have a story for you. I went to the gas station, and uh, gas is short, and prices are up. I went to the lumber yard. Lumber prices are up. Lumber short. I went to the newspaper, and conspiracy theories seem to be running out. They all turned out to be true. And I, I think about what we went through the last four years, all the true stories that were actually sanctioned or canceled because they were called conspiracy theories when the facts were there. I think as an American, you have to be more discerning now. You have to pick and choose your, your news sites more carefully and look for sites that don't have attitude, don't have snark, don't have opinion and trying to focus on facts. Facts are a stubborn thing. And I think that the key to unraveling some of the bad stories that occurred during the Trump years was sticking to the facts and not getting in all that silliness that went on. For sure, and you know, what's interesting here is that you mentioned uh, some of the stories that have just turned out to be true uh, and not conspiracy theories. And of course, we're talking about the Wuhan labs uh, story. We're also talking about the Trump photo shoot uh, at the church, all of that. And I'm gonna say, and hopefully Jack Dorsey isn't listening, uh, but, so I'm not gonna get banned or anything, but, but it does make you wonder, so on the 2020 election, they were wrong about Wuhan, they were wrong about the Trump photo shoot. And I'm just saying that this goes to a credibility issue, Jenna, as it relates to, well, why shouldn't there be questions that need to be answered, especially now on the heels of these two stories? You wonder, well, what's the next shoe to drop here? Yeah, absolutely, David. And I think the thing that's frustrating most of us is that we should be truth seekers, not just truth tellers. And the media, of course, and journalists should be truth tellers. But all of us, especially those of us who are Christians first and then conservatives, and then we support the candidates who support truth, we need to be truth seekers. And you can't seek the truth and find it without asking questions. And what we saw through the 2020 election is that we weren't even able to ask questions questions. And that's what was so frustrating. And even now, today, there are so many stories and so many things about whether it's the coronavirus, whether it's uh, the Wuhan lab leak, whether it's Russia collusion again, whether it's who's actually running the White House right now. Those are the questions that you're not allowed to ask on legacy media or on social media. But we need to be truth seekers and we need to be willing to stand boldly and ask those questions so that we get to the answers. 100%. Uh, Hogan, we live in a day and age now. I like to say we're in the day and age of the correspondent, is what I call this person. In other words, are they a correspondent? Are they a pundit? The lines are blurred. So what's your take on kind of where we are right now in terms of people trying to understand what they're hearing and from who they're hearing it from? First of all, that's a great word, and I appreciate that. Also, I've gone to the trademark office. <laughs> that's right. I appreciate all of you, too, for what you're doing in the fight you're willing to have. Um, I think being up on this stage, I'm, I'm so humbled. David, I've worked with you for years. John, the work you've done to expose the left, and Jenna, of course, the legal battles we, we've worked in together. Um, it, it's very humbling to be up here. And what we've seen in this country has been so scary in the last several years. Just the, the, the attacks on people who have stood up for truth. You use the word correspondent. One of the things I like to say is, they're no longer network news anchors they're network news actors. You see on their faces 
as they're telling these stories, just these so the somber, sad, the, the, it's so impactful for them. Instead of just delivering news to you and letting you decide, um, you know, you decide what, what you're hearing, you can pressure test it against the facts you've uncovered and the things you've seen. It's all about giving their opinion now. I think we've known that it's been that way for a long time. And I'll say, if you take a look at Donald Trump, and I worked for him for four years in the administration, also on the campaign, you take away everything he's been able to accomplish. Just forget for a moment the trade deals that actually worked for uh, American workers, the peace deals that people thought wouldn't happen, moving the embassy um, to, to Jerusalem, uh, rebuilding our military, historic funding for HBCUs. Forget all of the accomplishments that he was able to do on behalf of the American people. I think the one thing that will stand the test of time that is his legacy is he told all of us up on this panel and everybody in this room and everyone across the country, fight back. Don't let them pigeonhole you, attack you, call you names. You can fight back. That's something Donald Trump did for this country and I think for the future of this movement. It's important that we can stand up for the truth, we can ask the questions, and we can take the slings and arrows because we've been given kind of the permission by our former president to take those fights directly back at them. Hey, you know, what's interesting here is also when it comes to media bias, the stories they select to cover. Uh, and and it, it makes me think of this story, and John, if you can explain a little bit about the big story that, that you and Just the News broke uh, regarding what's happening in Georgia and Fulton County. Uh, big deal there, and I'll just tell you anecdotally, and I can't reveal this anchor's name for privacy sakes, but I can tell you that, that I was texting with a major network anchor about this story, and I said, why are you guys not covering this? Uh, and it was... Eh, I don't know, don't really see much there in the story. And I'm thinking to myself, true journalism, once again, true journalism, if you think about that, it's called investigations, FOIA requests, so many other things. So I wonder if you can talk about that. Yeah, sure. Um, over the last few weeks, uh, Justin News filed a series of FOIA requests in Georgia. And what we found is that while Brad Raffsenberger, the Secretary of State, was telling everybody on 60 Minutes, it was peachy keen here in uh, the state of Georgia, everything was going great. He had this extraordinary report in his files from the hand-picked person he sent to Atlanta that said everything went wrong in Atlanta. In fact, his, it's a 29-page report it's written like a diary. This happened at 8.02. This happened at uh, 1049. And it's a how not to run an election diary when you look at it. Uh, double, ballots were being double counted. Uh, voters' names were being exposed, so their privacy was in jeopardy. Uh, people were moving ballots around, taking them. No one knew where they went. No one knew who even took them. They didn't even know the person that took them. Some of the workers were talking in the elevator about uh, they were there not to count votes, but to mess things up. They used a little more colorful language than that. But um, all of this was sitting in Brad Raffsenberger's files for the last six months. And uh, just this last night, uh, we saw the Secretary of State in Georgia finally purge old names uh, from the voter database, something he didn't do last year. Uh, I would not be surprised if in the next few weeks you see the state of Georgia move in and take over Fulton County and say, we're gonna run the election going forward. That's, that's what our reporting is saying. And I think, but think about that. If it was so bad that he has to do that now, why didn't we know these things in November? And the answer is, reporters chose not to look at those facts. That's right. Yeah, and if you want more on the story, go to NBC Nightly News. No, you're not gonna go there. You're not getting that, guys. Uh, all right, so Jenna, so you host this uh, very, very, uh, I'm gonna use the, just, it's an important show, and it's called Just the Truth on Real America's Voice, and uh, it's, it, I want you to tell, tell people more about it, but explain the filter of that show, because in essence, it kind of gets to the heart of this discussion about how the media uh, is really not searching for the truth. Yeah, well, th thank you so much, David. And it, it's so true what John just said. Um, as most of you know, um, I was there with Rudy Giuliani representing the president during the election integrity effort um, as part of my role, thank you, with the campaign. And it was so frustrating to us that none of these courts were even willing to hear any of the claims. 
And what we did in front of the state legislatures and what was so obvious to all of you and the world that was watching is that we have to have transparency in our elections. We need to get to the truth. We had a very, very short window to tell these state legislators, please do your constitutional obligation, do your job. Through that experience, uh, I have been in media for a long time. Um, I've been a practicing attorney for even longer. And that experience showed me just how corrupt the media actually is, how much they want to drive the narrative, and how much, as Hogan said, they're not just actors. They are people who are activists. They have a narrative. It is not just the news anymore, and it's not even just opinion. It's specifically placed stories and specifically rejected stories. And that's not what we expect from journalism. That's not what we expect from media. We can all have our opinions, but we're not entitled to the facts. And so what I have partnered with Real America's Voice uh, to do with this show called Just the Truth is to get to the truth and actually have longer conversations with people and not just about politics, because all of you here, we care about politics, why? Because we care about culture, why? Because we care about the biblical worldview that is founded on the reality that every Every human being is made in the image of God and has inherent dignity and worth, right? So if we are going to care about politics, we have to first care fundamentally about the truth of the inerrant word of God. And so we have to have a broader scope than just politics. And so we have to, as we move forward, and we move and take the lessons learned from Donald Trump, who was, by the way, the one person in Washington who told every single person, regardless of where they were, you got to get off the fence. He was the one person that forced every person to stand and declare what their real position was. So we've got to continue to have these conversations rooted in biblical truth. Yeah, no, that's a great point. It's a great point. Um, and you know, what I like to say often is uh, this idea, remember, the, the Bible doesn't change. You know, uh, but never know what Chris Cuomo and Don Lemon and all these people, that, their standard, I'm not going with that standard. I don't know about you. I'll go with the biblical standard every single day. Um, I want to talk a little bit. So there was this news item the other day about Jake Tapper. This was a couple of months ago. And he's no longer going to have guests that have anything to do with January 6th about what happened on that day. I mean, what, Hogan, where are we exactly as it relates to now we have news anchors, and I'm putting that in air quotes, news anchors deciding who they're going to interview and who they're not going to interview based on the fact that these folks are lawmakers. They are newsmakers. And so what kind of dangerous zone are we going into? It's, it's, it's very dangerous for the future of this country. And I would say that, you know, bias comes in a couple of ways. What you cover and how you cover it. And you touched on something, Jenna, I thought was very important was it's not just that they want to drive a narrative that hurts the right, hurts all of you, that makes us look like loons. They actually push an activist agenda because they agree with the radical left policies of, uh, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib and others. And so what you see is a picking and choosing. You talked about the Bible a second ago. The Bible's also not a buffet. You don't get to pick and choose pieces out of it. It's the inherent, infallible, inspired word of the Lord. And you have to take it. These, these anchors, these journalists, these news folks, again, air quotes, they pick and choose things that only forward their narrative. And John had a great piece just recently about all the ways that they've been proven incorrect in the last little bit and how Trump was again proven right on so many things, but it's a dangerous place when these folks are the ones driving the news. And the president would always ask me, who's the worst? Who do you think's the worst to us? Who, who, doesn't treat us? who doesn't treat us right? And I would always point to people like CNN and like others because the problem with those outlets is they try to pass themselves off as news when the entire slate is opinion. There are places on Fox like Sean who will tell you he's an opinion journalist. There are places like the Daily Wire that Ben Shapiro will say, look, I'm a conservative. They tell you that up front. The most nefarious ones are the ones that try to tell you I'm all about news, but yet all they offer is opinion and activism. Those are the ones that are most dangerous to me. It's a good point, good point. 
Um, I can tell you on that same kind of that Jake Tapper question, uh, I had Marjorie Taylor Greene on my show uh, a few weeks ago, yeah. So once again, check NBC Nightly News to get an interview with her. Um, the, the, the point is, she told me that not only will none of the, the legacy media have her, uh, Fox News won't even have her. Fox News won't have her. So, so, so there's an interesting dynamic swirling out there. I'm just going to say it uh, re regarding that. By the way, a quick funny story about the president, and this is a media story about the president. It's one of my favorite stories. I was at this luncheon at the White House, and I was there. They sat me actually next to President Trump, and they're in the room with other media members. That was members. a mistake. What's that? So, that, was a, that must have been a mistake somehow. <laughs> I got to go back and ask the Secret Service well, about that. Well, I crashed. That. That's a, I crashed that's it. A, that's, yeah, that's a national security issue. I'm sorry. Did I say I wasn't invited? No, no, no. That's not true. Uh, but anyhow, so there I was in the room with Chris Cuomo, George Stephanopoulos, Chuck Todd, Jake, Jake Tapper, and Trump leans over to me and says, hey, before we get going, you want to say a prayer? So I said a prayer right in front of Chris Cuomo, George Stefan, and literally we passed out smelling salts. They were out. They were out. Uh, all right, John, fo FOIA request. Uh, can, can you kind of give us like a shoe leather journalism, uh, you know, maybe Reader's Digest version of what you do and why you break so many stories? I think people are curious as to how you get to the truth. You know, that's a great question. I think that one of the keys is you have to be able to talk to all people on all sides to get the truth, to get a 360 view. And I think so much of the media today only talks to one side. If you're only we're talking to Christopher Steele and Glenn Simpson and Fusion GPS, you got the Russia story really wrong. You have to be able to talk to the people in the FBI, the intelligence committee, Republicans, Democrats. That has become a lost art among most news agencies. They talk to their friends and that's it. And so they become an echo chamber instead of a purveyor of facts. And I think that's something that... Um, Hogan just said, really rang my bell, because I, when I look at it, it's exactly what is going on. Today, journalists start out with the conclusion of the story and then look for the facts to fill them in. That is the single most dangerous form. It's, it's journalism roadkill, because you're gonna get disproven time and time again. And I think Hogan was right on the money with that. We have to follow the facts and then decide what the story is after we have that. And better yet, we give the facts and let you decide, because you're plenty smart enough to decide for yourself. So those are, I think that's the big thing. FOIA is a wonderful thing. I file thousands of FOIAs a year, uh, Freedom of Information Act. Sometimes it's called open records. I have so many of them. My desk is just tall just with letters. Uh, but, you know, there's an openness in American government still that we don't appreciate. You put a request in, you might just get the documents. A lot of the Russia stories, a lot of the Georgia stories we just did came because of open records law. I encourage all of you, because you can file FOIAs too, go get the truth. That's the one way we, we get it every day in journalism. Uh, Jenna, the, uh, social media, let's talk about big tech censorship, social media. You have a huge following on Twitter. Uh, you like to engage with your followers. Uh, talk to me a little bit or talk to everyone about uh, where we're at on the social media landscape here and how folks in this room can better equip themselves to get at the truth in a very uh, censored but also volatile environment. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, first, be bold and ask the questions that you wanna ask. Uh, don't be afraid of the censorship because the moment that we choose to get off platform, censor ourselves or think, hmm, is Jack Dorsey or Mark Zuckerberg gonna care that I posted this? Then we are no longer serving the one true God. He's our only audience, that's it, okay? So I'm gonna continue to be bold on social media and continue to ask the questions, continue to uh, push back, and if they want to censor me, well, that day may come, but not today. And as long as I have a platform, I'm going to continue to speak truth. And I have to say, I learned from the best because one of the things that mainstream media continues to censor, and what we all saw so clearly through the Trump administration, was how perversely they treated him when we knew the truth about who he genuinely is, right? And they couldn't stop him because he continued to tell the truth and he didn't have to use the filter of the media to get his message out. He came directly to us, to the people. And we need to continue to do that as well. We need to be, there are so many avenues now and so many alternative media uh, sources where you can get out videos, you can get out platforms. You don't have to have uh, the legacy media. You don't have an editor, publisher, all of that. Obviously you need to be careful because you don't, but make sure 
sure that you're, you are participating in the public square. Because here, the First Amendment is so incredibly important because it's not just about what the government allows us to do, it's what we obligate our government to preserve and protect, right? The government is obligated to protect our freedom of speech, freedom of association, free exercise of religion, to do exactly what we're doing right here, which is to speak together the truth. We have to continue doing that. And to that point, you know, conservative Christians nowadays, with everything going on with cancel culture, conservative Christians are right at the top of the list. I mean, they, they clearly have, like, in, in a way, kind of a scarlet letter uh, on them uh, to a degree. Proudly, I mean, right? What's that? Go us. That's right. Call us any name you want. I don't care. That's right. So what, now I have to say birthing people? Really? Uh, check Genesis, by the way, FYI, media. Um, all right, Hogan, let me ask you, how do you deal with the media? Uh, you're on all the time with these folks. Uh, they, they'd like to spin your words, spin your stories, all of that. Do you take over-the-counter prescription meds? What's, how, do, how do you work that? Well, I used to think Trump derangement syndrome was something that the right used to kind of mock the left. I think they're going to do medical journals on that one day. I mean, to try to deal with these people, and I've done it for years, as you know, David, with various candidates, you know, with Mike Huckabee, with Rick Santorum, others that I've worked worked with for so long, and, and, and then to go in with Donald Trump. Folks, I've known these, these members of the media for a long time, and the level of vitriol that came my way after I joined that administration blew my mind with people I thought were my friends, I thought appreciated my work uh, in politics. They did not, and what the administration was able to do through myself, Sarah, Stephanie, Kaylee, everybody, was expose exactly the mindset of the media, how perverse it is, um, how myopic it is on trying to take down a, a president. And a great example of this, the other day I was just thinking about Joe Biden snapping at a reporter in, in uh, uh, I guess, or Geneva. Oh, how I wish Joe Biden would have shown the same level of anger toward Vladimir Putin that he showed to an American journalist, but I digress. For him to get so angry at a very simple, reasonable question kind of proves the point. And afterwards, there were no stories that Joe Biden was a misogynist. There were no stories that Joe Biden was attacking the First Amendment and was threatening our freedom of speech. That happened to Donald Trump every single day. The difference is so stark and so clear with how the media has been covering one side versus the other that that goes back to the fight back situation I was talking about. And so when I go on television, I'm no longer afraid to offend. I'm no longer afraid to, you know, you gotta carefully choose words, of course, but it's time to take the fight directly to those who have been fighting against us for decades. And can I add one thing to that too? Uh, that is so well said. And I think also we need to realize that our speech is so important to continue to put the truth out there. We can't be concerned about speaking against, for example, the LGBT movement, CRT, all of these things that are so biblically false, right? And if we are doing this for the purpose of just owning the libs or just, you know, liberal tears or some of those things that are, you know, great slogans, fine. But at the end of the day, that shouldn't be our motivation. I would submit to you, we need to also speak the truth in love because if we move forward, if all we're doing is trying to fight by attacking, then we've lost our mission and we've lost our purpose. We have to continue to speak truth because that is the great commission. That, that's, that's so true. Um, I want to go down the line a little bit, if you maybe think of a, we all know Donald Trump in this room, and I, I don't know if there's a story or if there's something that maybe you can relay uh, to this audience uh, to kind of give you a sense of, of who he is, because the media has a certain caricature of, of how he is, uh, but, but the four of us in this room know him, and he, just like all of us, we have all different sides in terms of just we're trying to kind of work it all through. 
Can you give us a sense of the Trump that you, you know, maybe kind of going down the line? So we can, this place of the media bias question because once again, the media loves to just take lazy narratives about Donald Trump and every other uh, topic out there. You know, I, I've always been struck that public persona is so strong and, and he fights all the time, but behind the scenes, what I've seen is a man who's remarkably compassionate to people. He actually cares if someone's sick, he calls you up and says, how are they doing? Uh, I remember one day I, I, was, I came in to see him briefly and I said, hey, one of our friends is sick. And he said, get him on the phone right now. And he literally called right away and he was, he was busy. He had to go to, a, in fact, he left the cabinet, sitting in the cabinet room so he could have the call. But I, I think people never have seen that side of Donald Trump. I think those who are on the inside get to see it a little bit, but there's a compassion and a kindness to him that gets masqueraded by the media personality that's out there. Very true. Go down the, I'll go down the line. Uh, so there's so many stories, and that's absolutely true, that uh, that he is such a kind, wonderful, and really funny person. I think his humor is something that uh, the media refuse to show. And I have so many stories, I think you're probably all familiar with uh, how he met my dad when my dad came to the White House. He asked to meet my father and said, uh, I just wanted to tell you that I'm so proud of your daughter, which to me was a, an amazing moment, of course, because my dad has championed my career for, uh, you know, since I was a little girl and at 14 knew I wanted to be a lawyer. But uh, one of my other favorite stories that you may not know, um, so so I was uh, speaking at the Colorado Trump rally, and I went uh, back with the president on Air Force One, and I get a call uh, while we're in the air from a, uh, a local legislator that I knew, because I'm from Colorado, and, uh, and he said, you know, we really wanted to get this family who had lost their son in a shooting in Colorado a few years prior. We really wanted to get uh, the parents of uh, this young man back to meet the president. That didn't happen. And I said, you know what, I am so sorry, and, um, you know, let me, let me just let the president know. So I went up to Dan Scavino and I said, so here's what's going on. He's like, just go tell him, just go tell him. And I was like, okay. So, you know, I go in and knock on his office and we're about to land in Las Vegas. And he says, well, get him on the phone, get him on the phone right now. And I'm going, okay, so how, how do I do this? And I'm thinking, how do I call? And so just literally on my cell phone. And at this point, if you know me, I love pink sparkle everything. And I have a pink sparkle case on my iPhone and I'm planning on somehow like transferring this to his desk or whatever. He's like, no, just give me the phone. Imagine if you will, the president of the United States sitting in his office on Air Force One, doesn't care on my pink sparkle iPhone going, oh, I am so sorry. Tell me everything about your son. And I'm like, I wish I had my phone so I could take a picture right now, right? <laughs> but he was on it. And that's the kind of man he is. He just, he loves people so much that he's just willing to say, get them on the phone, call them in here. I care. And that's the kind of person he is. Uh, yeah, Hogan. That's great. He, he, it really is great. And he is that way, y'all. And I, I'm going to go a little bit different direction because I have similar stories to people he's reached out to. But I'll say, I'll say two quick ones. One is, when you see what Joe Biden does to the press, I'm gonna give you a great example. You know, everything with Joe Biden scripted, it's on teleprompter, the questions are known ahead of time, the reporters are told, you know, the staff tells them who to call on. We would always tell the president who's in the room because a lot of times it was a press pool and they rotate out, here's who does this, here's who said that. And he said, well, tell me about their stories. I said, well, this person didn't do a good story today, it was very negative and this story was okay. So before he goes out, he'll often say, now which one did the bad story? and I'll point to it on the list and he'll slap me on the shoulder and wink and say, thanks. He'll go out to the microphone and the first person he calls on every time was the person who was the worst to him. <clears throat> because he relished in having that conversation because he wanted to deliver to you, the American people, exactly you know, what his mindset was all about and what he'd been able to accomplish. And second, it's brief. On Air Force One, oftentimes he would call the first lady in to have different conversations about things. And one day we were on our way back from somewhere listening to music on a speaker. And he calls the first lady in and they had such a sweet relationship, y'all. Regardless of what the media says, it was so precious to watch them together. And he says, honey, honey, come in, come in. And she comes walking in and she says, yes. And they start talking about a song and we're all having a conversation. He goes, Hogan, look at our first lady. And I said, yes, sir. And he goes, is she not the best first lady we have ever had? <laughs> and I said, of course, of course, Mr. President. He goes, ah, ah, only the great Martha Washington. She was first, honey, honey, babe, she was first. You're, number, you're, you're second, but you're, you're a strong second. 
So it was always funny to watch them together and always a good time. That's great. Uh, a quick Trump story. Um, he, would, he calls people, obviously, all the time. He called me one time. I had just a, done a hit on MSNBC with Joe Scarborough. Sorry, I mentioned the name. Um, but that was, this was during the campaign, and Marco Rubio was still in the race. And I was talking to Joe Scarborough on MSNBC Morning Joe about Marco Rubio, and I get a call right after the live shot, and it's Donald Trump. And he goes, he doesn't say hello. He just says, hey, you weren't very nice to me. Is what he says. I said, what, but what do you mean? I was talking about Marco Rubio, not you. He goes, I know. You were saying nice things about Rubio. That's bad for Trump. <laughs> That's what he said. And then I said, because I'm from New York and he's from New York, I said, you're a piece of work, is what I said. And then he goes, I know. And then he started having this belly laugh on the phone. The, the point is, he likes to rib people. He likes to jab people. Uh, so anyhow, th that concludes our panel. Real quick, I actually interviewed President Trump on Monday, this Monday, uh, on the water cooler. Uh, which is on Real America's Voice. You can just go download it uh, anywhere. It's on Pluto, across the country. Uh, my Our goodness. free app. Go download the app right now. Thank you. You there see, you social media. Yeah. See. Uh, anyhow, so President Trump, that'll be at 3 p.m. Eastern on Monday. Also, Jenna Ellis, Just the Truth, her show, nightly at 6 p.m. Nightly, 6 p.m. On Real America's Voice, and of course, justthenews.com. Uh, big deal. FOIA requests going wild over there. So, uh, all right, thanks everybody, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you all, God bless.